what is it that leaders do? Our conclusion is that you know it is absolutely about the way the organization is wired, and that the leaders are ultimately responsible for creating the organizational wiring that uh, causes the organization to be at one extreme uh, or the other. Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host Peter High. My guest today is Gene Kim. Gene was a co-founder and chief technology officer of Tripwire, a company he helped lead for 13 years, dating until 2010. And soon thereafter, he turned his full-time attention to studying and writing about high-performing organizations. He helped kick off the DevOps revolution with his mega bestseller, The Phoenix Project, in 2013. He's gone on to author or co-author numerous other books, including The Unicorn Project, The DevOps Handbook, and Accelerate. His latest book, co-authored with Steven Spear, is Wiring the Winning Organization, uh, I should also mention that since 2014, he's been the founder and organizer of DevOps Enterprise Summit, studying the technology transformations of large, complex organizations. And surely we'll get into uh, some of what he has seen and diagnosed through his writings, through his observations, through his counseling of many executives and the like. Gene Kim, welcome back to Technovation. It's always a pleasure to see you. Oh, Peter, I, it's so great to see you again. And congratulations on all your achievements. And I'm just so delighted to be here today. Oh, I feel the same way. Thank you so much. Well, look, I wanted to start with uh, your latest book. I just mentioned it, of course, Wiring the Winning Organization. Congratulations on yet a, another great contribution uh, to the field. What was the problem that you noticed in your study of organizations that you thought needed solving uh, that led to writing this book? Oh, yeah. What a great question. Yeah. So uh, for me, it was this uh, kind of maybe stepping back and looking at, you know, uh, what really are the hallmarks of great organizations and not so great organizations. And uh, working with uh, Dr. Steven Spear, who I'll introduce more fully, uh, we started to come to the conclusion that, uh, you know, th it is so easy to observe in the screams in great organizations, uh, you know, say are somehow able to fully uh, liberate everyone's problem solving capabilities and the full potential of them, uh, you know, to to, for their talents, their creativity, and so forth, um, and they can do their work easily and well. And um, you know, on the other side, you see these organizations, and uh, I think we've had uh, friends or maybe personal experience in an organization that somehow um, constrain or extinguish entirely <laughs> people's abilities to contribute to the greatest goals, to solve problems uh, easy and well. And uh, we found that that was a uh, dynamic that we saw not just in software organizations, you know, whether it's uh, you know DevOps versus non DevOps, but in uh, manufacturing, in engine design, and in uh, in the military, uh, and and so uh, our conclusion and uh, our deep belief that we spent uh, three years uh, really trying to understand is what is it that leaders do. Our conclusion is that you know it is absolutely about the way the organization is wired, and that the leaders are ultimately responsible for creating the organizational wiring that. Uh, causes the organization to be at one extreme uh, or the other. And so uh, a secondary goal was to really understand what is in common when you look at all these different domains. Uh, uh, what's in common between Agile and DevOps and the Toyota production system, uh, you know, lean manufacturing, resilience engineering, safety culture, psychological safety. Um, and there was no better co-author and collaborator than uh, Dr. Steven Spear, who uh, I remember reading his uh, probably the most famous Harvard Business Review article of all time, uh, the 1999 paper called "Decoding the DNA of the Toyota Production System," and uh, uh, that was uh, based on his doctoral dissertation that he did at the Harvard Business School. And he extended that work beyond just uh, the high repetition work of manufacturing, but uh, also to uh, helping build a safety culture at Alcoa, to uh, design and operations of all of the nuclear reactors in the U.S. Navy seagoing fleet and so forth. So it's been the most intellectually challenging thing I've ever worked on, but also the most rewarding just because, uh, um, you know, they say anyone can take something uh, simple and make it appear complex. Yeah, uh, it, uh, It's something else to try to take something that looks complex and really establish and distill out what are the simple principles at work. Yeah, well said. And I, I would certainly say that uh, the book does a very nice job of taking a number of complex ideas and simplify <laughs> them, uh, simplifying them for the reader. <laughs> uh, and I, you talk about uh, the magic that winning organizations have, and you talk the, about and uh, write about among the ideal scenarios is providing teams and individuals enough time scheduled to mm -hmm. plan, practice, experiment, and improve. Talk a bit about this time element at, at a at a point in time where we're, we often talk about the need for speed, the need for uh, you know being more rapid in how we develop what we develop. Uh, I found it really interesting interesting that uh, you talk an awful lot about the necessity to not overblow that, and in fact, provide ample time for for the kinds of activities I just noted. Talk a bit. Oh about yeah, that if you would. 
Yeah, that's a, a great one. And so um, maybe I can just back up one second. You know, so what was so fun and rewarding about uh, working with Steve and what we put into the book uh, was whenever you see an organization transform from, you know, uh, not so great to great or for worst to first, you know, there's, uh, you know, for them to transform, we're suggesting that there's only three mechanisms um, of which that is made possible. And uh, it's because these mechanisms, uh, slowification is one of them, simplification and amplification are what takes us from, uh, you know, conditions where it's very difficult to solve problems. You know, so if you can just conjure up in your mind, like when is it tough to solve problems? It's when you're under a lot of urgent time pressure. It's when uh, there's a you know a lot of consequentiality where mistakes cause huge problems and cascade outwards. Um, it's when you can't undo, uh, you can't get multiple trials at bat. And these are the conditions that make it really difficult or even impossible to learn because, you know, learning is experiential and experimental. And, uh, you know, so in the ideal, right, we want to uh, create the conditions where Problem solving is easier. So that means it's, uh, you know, it's safer. You have more time. Um, you know, small problems stay small. They don't, you know, ripple out and cause huge problems. Um, and you can work independently of others. You're not stuck uh, having to communicate and coordinate with everybody in the organization. And so um, one of the three components of how you get from here to there uh, is by slowifying. Uh, so slowification is, I think, a concept that uh, everyone probably intuitively understands it's uh you know there are many adages of the concept you know you got to slow down to speed up you got to stop sawing to sharpen the saw and uh slowification isn't a real word uh, the readers might notice and that's because uh, there was no word in english that really captured that concept and you know i think uh there's a school of thought that says if you can't say it you can't think it <laughs> and so we felt it was really important to create that word slowify which means move your most difficult problem solving so that's not in production. You, you have to do it in planning and practice, and you have to make um, time for that, right? So the you know, the adage of quality is uh, free. Well, it's not quite true. You're making a short-term investment for a longer-term gain. Um, and uh, so whenever you find yourself in a situation where uh, you know you see things going wrong, right? And uh, you know, uh, I'm hoping that people will say, "Oh, we need to slowify." You know, just like you have to take a uh, time out in the middle of a game, or you have to, um, you know, you have the halftime periods. You can actually call a timeout, right, to say, "Hey, let's stop what we're doing because we have lost uh, control of the situation, maybe even our awareness of what's going on, and uh, we have to use that time to uh, develop routines, to do some sense making, to do some experimentation, so that we're better prepared uh, for you know production environments." Which, uh, uh, sorry for rambling, but I think whenever you see someone doing you know, great work in highly consequential environments like uh, firefighting or, uh, you know, uh, aviation combat or, uh, you know, sports teams, you know that they had to have invested in playing and practice because that's the only way they could have developed those routines and skills because you certainly can't do it in the middle of the game or in the middle of the uh, production scenarios. Does that resonate with you? It does yeah. indeed. Yeah. And and what I found really interesting is a lot of the examples you give, Amazon is a company you profile <laughs> multiple parts of the organization for good reason, or a Google or a Netflix, uh, even a Vanguard, where you talk about the speed with which they can they can execute, which they're kind of legendary for, is actually built upon uh, a deliberative process that's allowed them to get there. So oftentimes there's the mistake we make uh, of believing that it's always been about speed, that, that but right. we don't recognize the the steps, the the slowifying that was necessary uh, through that process in order to deliver uh, that that pace. Is that is that fair? Oh yeah, absolutely. And so one of the um, uh, case studies we put into the book uh, was about you know how is it that uh, Google and Vanguard and uh, uh, Amazon are so resilient that they can do you know the you know. Uh, unprecedented amount of transactions, you know, uh, every second. And, uh, you know, it was through, um, obviously there's some technology uh, involved, but the majority of it is not the technical part of the socio-technical system. It is the socio part of the socio-technical system. In fact, maybe if I can uh, uh, maybe elevate that point is that we're saying there's really three domains of work in any organization. There's, uh, you know, layer one is uh, maybe the code we're working on or the uh, production artifact is running in production. Uh, it could be the patient in front of us. Layer two is a technology that we're using. So it could be the uh, IDE, it could be the uh, platform like Kubernetes, it could be the uh, MRI machine. But layer three uh, is the social circuitry of how our organizations work, who's allowed to talk to whom, uh, in what format. And that is responsibility of the leader. They are responsible for, in the ideal, wholly responsible for creating the wiring so that people can get what they want 
uh, when they need it, in the format they need it, talking not to everybody, but talking to, you know, ideally the one person or do it ideally, you know, on demand. So that's a mark of great wiring. Um, Peter, I think this will resonate with you. I had a friend tell me about uh, his organization. The number one initiative in this mobile telco uh, service provider is to get a checkbox in front of every one of their 20 million customers so they can opt into a monthly service to get email or watch movies. Um, it is estimated to take $28 million, uh, one year to do. It requires CEO minus one level support, daily war room meetings, uh, because that's transit across 40 different teams. Oh, and everyone gives it a 20% chance of success because it didn't work the first two times they tried it. <laughs> and so uh, for me, it was so clarifying to say, to point out that this is not a challenging problem at layer one or layer two. This is entirely dominated by layer three um, around the need to communicate and coordinate, to prioritize, to escalate, to cajole, to uh, politic, right? And these are all signs that uh, leaders have not created the right wiring that allow people to do their work easily and well, uh, right? And so this is not a technology problem, even though uh, it's stuck in the top, you know, uh, OKR of the technology team. Uh, so this is something that business leaders and technology leaders should look at and say, hey, what is our responsibility for creating, you know, the organization that leads to great outcomes or poor outcomes? Does that resonate with you? It does indeed. It does indeed. And, and it, it uh, draws nicely into your second point, uh, from, from your, your you've already talked about slowification from the subtitle of your book, Liberating Our Collective Greatness Through Slowification, Simplification, and Amplification. Let's talk about simplification, the, the next of those, and so, some of what you you mean by that, the necessity at a time where as, as uh, organizations grow, as org structures grow, the socio uh, aspects yeah. of this that become more complicated uh, through that growth, the importance to bear in mind simplification. Talk a bit about some of the pathways there. Yeah, for sure. So slowification is all about moving the problem solving uh, in time. So it's not in production, it's in planning and practice. Simplification is about, is about changing the nature of the problems themselves so they are easier to solve. Um, and so there's really three ways to do that. Uh, you can take big problems and uh, chop them up temporarily. So incrementalism, uh, so it's like agile uh, versus waterfall, right? I think that should be very familiar to uh, uh, all of us. The second um, me uh, mechanism for this is um, modularization. So the most famous example of this uh, in our space is probably Amazon in the early 2000s, where amazingly enough, uh, you know, Amazon is so famous for its agility, actually almost ground to a halt in the early 2000s. So in the late 90s, they were doing hundreds of deployments per day, you know, shipping new capabilities to customers, um, you know, uh, probably may have, may have been hundreds of week, uh, a, a year. But by the early 2000s, as they moved from you know just books and music and toys, uh, by 2003, they had 35 different product categories, including clothing, apparel, and so forth. And um, what's astonishing is that uh, they could not ship code anymore. Uh, it took long to get code out there. They were only doing tens of deployments uh, per year, and most deployments didn't finish. You know, something went wrong. And so Amazon uh, CTO Werner Vogels, uh, Dr. Werner Vogels, he said uh, – um, there was this ridiculous situation where the Amazon digital teams for years were required uh, in order to fulfill an order, uh, customers had to put in a shipping address. Right? And so obviously this is absurd. But so the digital teams went to the 35 different ordering teams and uh, said, could you, you know, exempt us from the need for a shipping address? And the response was, uh, we didn't budget for it. And so now they were stuck, just like that mobile telco company. Uh, this meant like the telco, all of their time was not in layer one and layer two work, people doing their work easily and well. It was in layer three communication and coordination. And so this is what led to the two pizza team where the goal was uh, Jeff Bezos's uh, edict was for small teams uh, to be able to work independently of each other. That could be, you know, um, a, to work autonomously and deployed towards Amazon's largest problems. Um, and so this led to the modularization of uh, Amazon's e-commerce site so that you know they were doing tens of deployments a year to 2011 they were doing uh 15,000 deployments per day by 2015 they're doing 136,000 deployments per day <laughs> and so yeah, it was a billion dollar investment to re-architect all of Amazon but you know the, the payoff has been incalculable and so this is about uh and that was made possible by creating independence of action right that uh, people could work independently of each other, that small problems stayed small. They wouldn't ripple out and cause uh, catastrophic mayhem. And, and so I'm hoping that resonates with you, 
Peter? In, indeed it does, uh, Gene. And I, I wonder, you know, uh, the, the downside at times and thinking about Amazon as the case example, of mm -hmm. course, is the budgets and the brain power <laughs> and the sanctity of technology and its practices within an organization like this. But in the years that have followed, thankfully, a lot of digital immigrant organizations, those born before the digital age, I mean, companies, of course, uh, have followed suit and made you know, these uh, consequential investments to be able to reap the rewards, uh, maybe not at the same scale as an Amazon across the board, but in similar ways. And especially as somebody who speaks so often with um, execs, execs from organizations, many of them born many, many decades ago, are you seeing appropriate levels of, of progress associated with this? And you know, are there some differentiating points between some versus others? Yeah, um, I think the good news is uh, there's been so much uh, progress. And in fact, we even have words for it that's like, you know, a, you know we have to create APIs, you have to create microservices. Uh, but I think, you know, the uh, the problem that still remains is that this is often viewed as a surely technology problem. And uh, one of my hopes in the book is that we can say, uh, no, this is a organizational problem that, uh, you know, we can solve the uh, organizational social circuitry for the technology organization, but in the case of the mobile telco, right? If you don't change, you know, the entire organization, uh, then everyone's still stuck. And uh, but what I'm hoping is that you know what Amazon shows so well is that modularity, creating independence of action, you know, creates enormous um, upside ability. And by make and the most important signal is can people do their work easily and well? And uh, that is really should be one of the signals that any leader, technology leader or business leader, should be you know hyper attuned to. Can I sure. give you one counterexample that uh, oh, yes, might be I of love interest? That. So um, it was really fun to um, put a another example in the uh, uh, book. One of them was about the rapid evolution of the Apple iPhone and especially on the keyboard. You know how they uh, iterated on it many times because in um, uh, one year into the Apple iPhone project, you know. Um, uh, the person who was in charge of that couldn't even type his name, right? And so they actually stopped uh, all uh, development, all of the, uh, I think it was uh, uh, 30 engineers at the time who were working on the iPhone. Um, you know, they dropped everything just to work on keyboards, right? And uh, uh, Ken Koshenda, uh, who was the amazing, was amazing book on the, the, his experience with Apple, said it, never in his history at Apple did he ever observe you know, everyone's stopping work just to work on one thing. Uh, so a great example of slowification. Uh, and so obviously they solved that problem. Uh, but it was interesting to also get uh, the perspective from uh, Risto Salasma. Uh, he was the chairman of Nokia. He was the founder of F-Secure. And he described how, you know, they saw the Apple iPhone coming, but there was a very different dynamic um, where he – uh, described the most uh, shocking moment of his history that led him to becoming chairman and then CEO of Nokia when he heard from the VP of strategy of Nokia that the compile times for the Symbian operating system, of which they were depending upon to compete with uh, the Apple iPhone, took 48 hours. <laughs> and he said, he said it felt like being hit in the head uh, with a sledgehammer because he knew that if every engineer – required two days to determine if their change worked or didn't work, right? Then, you know, all their hopes, dreams, and aspirations that hinged on Symbian OS was an illusion. And he said, uh, when I asked him, you know, how did you take something that sounded so tactical, you know, like a compile time, uh, compile durations, uh, how did you equate that to something that was an existential threat in the boardroom? And he said, uh, something that I'll just never forget. He said, in any organization, uh, you have people doing the most important work of the organization. And you have to ask, how easy is it for those people to do their work? And as a former developer, he said when he heard two days for people to compile their code, right, he knew that it was impossible. So there's two possibilities. Either, either leaders did not know, which was a huge problem, or leaders knew and they didn't do anything about it. And either case was so damning that that led to the firing of the CEO and <laughs> – <laughs> he was asked to step in as uh, as the CEO. But for me, it was such a phenomenal example of how important it is to have not just independence of action, but be able to do your work quickly, easily, to get fast feedback on your work. And this is something that should be, uh, again, that any senior leader should be able to recognize, you know, is it, um, are these the dynamics that we're seeing or is it not? Uh, how am I doing? Yeah, you know? I, I, really interesting. The power of decoupling, as you noted, as being the yeah. accelerant of what you've described, independence of action, rapid iteration, and the like. For the process nerds out there, right? Uh, I had mentioned there's a third mechanism of uh, 
simplification, that's linearization. And so that's where whenever you see something like an assembly line or the Toyota production process uh, or continuous integration pipelines, uh, those are um, those do for sequential activities what modularization does for parallel activities. So um, in our world, you know, automated testing pipelines are so great because it creates independence of action of the developers from the uh, QA engineers to the security engineers. And so automation is a piece of the story for sure, but it creates the same sort of um, uh, independence of action optionality that modularity does. So what a, that was a, one of the neatest insights uh, in the book. I, I agree. Very interesting. I, mean, I appreciate <laughs> you underscoring that. Well, let's let's turn to amplification, the the uh, completing the troika of solification, <laughs> simplification, now amplification. Talk talk a bit about uh, what you what you mean by that. Oh, for sure, yeah. So, um, uh, amplification is all about uh, making sure that the uh, organization, the organizational circuitry, can uh, take e the, even the most uh, weakest of signals of failure. Uh, or where, where problems need help. And those can be generated, transmitted, most importantly, received um, and acted upon so that uh, people can decisively you know, detect and correct for those problems as well as ideally prevent them from uh, happening again in the future. And again, you know, I think the extremes are, you know, we can create an organization where even these weak signals uh, of failure are amplified and acted upon quickly. So, uh, or in the worst case, they're hidden uh, they are suppressed or extinguished entirely. And I think the uh, Risto Salasma Nokia example is a great one where he, got the, uh, he received the signal, but it was far too late, as he wrote in the book. You know, this, uh, not only did they fire the CEO, they abandoned Symbian OS to move to Windows Mobile. But as he wrote, you know, it was too late you know, to change the fortunes of Nokia. So you know, uh, leaders um, have a very unique role in that. We call it organizational culture, psychological safety. But uh, you know, clearly, we want the ability for anyone to say what they really think, <laughs> to talk about risks, to uh, be able to bring up you know innovative solutions and bring them to bear. Um, and so we're using. I think what I'm proud of is that uh, we're taking you know the concepts like um, organizational culture and psychological safety, and we're. Uh, describe it in terms that an engineer would understand. It's about signal generation uh, trans and transmission and reception. And, um, you know, there are things that leaders can do to make sure that signals might not be generated. Important signals <laughs> might not be generated, might not be received, <laughs> might be uh, – people might be deterred from sharing bad news. Um, and there are things that leaders can do to uh, – reward that. And so uh, one of the people that we talk about a lot in the book is Gene Krantz, famous for his uh, contribution to the Apollo space program, where uh, after the uh, deaths of three astronauts for Apollo 1, uh, he talked about how important it was uh, that people um, say what they really think. That you know, He talked about how we knew that uh, we weren't going to make it. We were hoping that the people at the Cape would uh, slip the schedule, not us, and uh, it was our responsibility, you know, to uh, make sure that we're never in those conditions again. And uh, it's so interesting that he models, you know, someone with not only high energy and high standards, but you know, he's imploring people that uh, that safety is everybody's job, and everyone has a contribution uh, to making sure that whenever we don't understand something, uh, when we see something that's wrong, it's our responsibility to fix it uh, at all levels of the organization. Yeah, and you know your work, Gene, over the years, including and through uh, the the publication of this book, has always I, I have found been about uh, at a minimum making the traditional silos of organizations more permeable. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the, the the bringing together of disciplines, DevOps being a phenomenal example of it. The traditional uh, sort of uh, wall between development and operations, where you know something is thrown over the wall, and only at that point does the <laughs> operations team actually know what to do or or begin to act. And now you add SEC into the middle of that, and you have some un what at least historically have been uncommon bedfellows operating together, and then actually continuing uh, with what's being produced. Uh, all along the way, I, I, I feel like this is a um, you you, you talk about the story of Justin Arbuckle, the uh, chief information oh, yeah. security officer of G Capital. I've heard you tell that story before. I wonder maybe if you could you can uh, talk a bit about some of the insights that uh, Justin shared with you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I can tell you the concrete story first and then how, my interpretation of that over the years, how it's changed and yeah. uh, the real wisdom in, in his stories. 
So uh, Justin Arbuckle was a chief information security officer at GE Capital uh, for uh, many years. And we were talking about like what, how should information security interact with uh, development and operations? And he, what he told me seemed initially preposterous <laughs> it's because it was so alien to me. Essentially, he said one of the best things that information security uh, professionals and leaders can do is just attend uh, the weekly demos of uh, the products as they're being developed uh, within development. And um, I think the reason why I thought it was so strange and preposterous was that it was just so informal. Um, uh, but he convinced me um, as he told the story because he said, one, you get to see what's going on in the organization, right? You know, people may not uh, be um, so readily uh, willing to share with information security what they're working on. You know, if, uh, if they've had a reputation of, uh, you know, kiboshing, you know, anything innovative and new, uh, and if create burdensome bureaucratic processes <laughs> that suck the will to live out of everyone it touches. But he said, um, so one is, you know, you get to see what's going on. Two is you get to see what the business goals that they're going after. You can see, um, you know, potentially, you know, are they um, – you know, storing user uh, personal identifiable information that then needs to be protected. And what a great time to come to the table and say, hey, look, if you're storing PII, uh, then you need to protect it. And hey, you know, uh, we even have some capabilities and people and tools that you can use to store it. Or better yet, how about you not store it at all? <laughs> it's like toxic waste in an organization. Maybe the best thing to do is just get rid of it, especially if you there's no reason to keep it around. And what I um, I think I was reacting to is that those interactions don't feel like the high ceremony, high stakes uh, interactions between uh, technology and information security, where often you have to sort of submit your uh, uh, request to be certified to go into production. Instead, it's far more collegial. And those, um, if you were to observe those interactions, it looks like what colleagues and friends do to help each other. <laughs> and I think that's really uh, what you want. And so I think um, in the book, we have this metaphor for moving a couch as a metaphor for solving problems. And uh, do you mind if I do a little verbal performance art? Please do. Uh, I, I, I love this. I was going to, if you weren't uh, mentioning now, I was certainly going to prompt you soon. It's such a great story and analogy that you provide. Yeah. So, you know, it's, I think, you know, we can almost boil down every kind of problem solving activity, especially across um, silos into uh, moving couch. Let's call them Steve and Gene moving couch. And, uh, on first blush, it sounds like you know this has nothing to do with knowledge work because it's pure brawn work. And yet, Steve and Jean moving a couch, they have to solve many problems like where's the center of gravity, uh, around which axis do they need to rotate to get through a narrow doorway? If they need to go down a narrow winding set of stairs, uh, you know who goes first? You know should they face forwards or backwards? And they don't need consultants, they don't need focus groups. Just by picking up the couch, right? Uh, trial and error communicating, coordinating, um, you know, they will figure out how to solve the problems. But uh, we as leaders, we can do many things to make their work more difficult. Uh, for example, turn off all the lights, <laughs> right? You know, uh, it becomes more dangerous. It will take longer. Uh, they could damage the couch or themselves. Uh, but there's all these things, other things we can do, like, uh, for example, introduce a lot of background noise. And so this introduces a different dimension of difficulty than turning off the lights because this prevents Steve and Gene from communicating, coordinating directly with each other. In fact, we can introduce an intermediary uh, who um, you know, insists that Steve and Gene can't talk to each other directly. Instead, they have to go through JIRA tickets or work orders or account managers or lawyers. <laughs> right? And what you'll rapidly find is that Steve and Gene might not be able to solve the problem together. And so the Amazon example before – modularization uh, was when they had 3,000 software engineers all coupled to one couch. No one could work independently. And so by chopping up to hundreds or thousands of couches, right, that's what allowed them to have independence of action. Um, so information security is uh, something similar, right? Is that, um, you know, instead of information security being coupled to every couch, how about if they just made tools so Steve and Gene can still be responsible for security, but they will use the tools like lifts and jacks, you know, so that they don't need the security person there, right? Just like Justin Arbuckle did, right? He decoupled himself uh, from the majority of the work, right? So he can, you know, coach and consult, but also, you know, if they want access to the capabilities that the InfoSec team made, you know, um, that can be done without Justin Arbuckle or any of his people being there. And so I think um, the couch is... Uh, I think a great metaphor and a diagnostic is, are you in situations where you have too many people coupled to one couch, where no one can, can get anything done, where you're spending all your time in layer three coordination, uh, 
just trying to interact with other people. Or the opposite case where we've accidentally cut the couch into too many pieces. And now it's like the uh, the checkbox project where, uh, um, you know, somehow uh, we are a very similar phenomenon, right? Is that uh, somehow we've created an organization where uh, we have 3,000 little chairs, <laughs> right? When we really, we should have one couch. Uh, how am I doing? Really great. I love this. The whole notion of uh, joint cognition and joint problem solving really leading to magic uh, in so many different ways. I And I love that analogy, as I said. Another great analogy you share in the book is the 70 year evolution of hospitals. Oh. And I wonder, <laughs> wonder if you could take a moment and talk a bit about that as sort of a uh, uh, a way in to understand uh, the growing complexity of enterprises, generally speaking, as well as the pathway to solving that complexity. Oh, yeah, for sure. You know, I, I cannot tell you just how many things I learned uh, working on this book with uh, Dr. Stephen Spear. Um, yeah, so one of them was uh, his observation that uh, hospital systems, which are so notoriously complex uh, these days, um, you know, the life as a patient, uh, especially in uh, emergency departments, are, is sometimes harrowing. <laughs> uh, there's a story about uh, Steve uh, his daughter going into a hospital uh, after she broke her wrist and they had to wait for hours in the uh, lobby. Um, the x-ray was initially uh, taken on the wrong arm. Uh, she got a plaster cast instead of a fiber glass cast. You know, for a nine-year-old, that's not so great uh, because of supply chain issue. And they to schedule a follow-up meeting. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they didn't know who to call. They had to call an outside line you know, to, uh, to arrange for follow-ups. And so this is just a all indicative of you know the layer three wiring not allowing you know clinicians and staff to do their work easily or well not great for the staff not great for the patient it turns out that if you rewind the clock 70 years this was just not a problem and the uh, our uh, conjecture is that it was only it was because there were so few silos you had doctors and nurses back then no technology teams so there's no layer two teams at all and so Compare an organization that has to integrate the work of two silos versus 80 silos. You have, to, you know, with, just within clinicians these days, you have scores of silos. Uh, imaging is no longer, it used to be called radiology. Now it's called imaging because not just, you know, x rays, it's, it's MRIs and CAT scans, all of which have different layer two uh, technologies allowed. So the more silos and functional specialties you have, the more sophisticated the layer three social circuitry must be. And so as a leader, right, it means that uh, you know, our work is becoming ever more difficult. And so anyone who thinks that the uh, job of technology leaders is the same or you know getting easier, I, I have bad news for you, my friends, <laughs> is that it's getting harder, especially with generative AI, AI ops, ML ops. It's not just DevOps and security anymore. It's so much larger whose expertise needs to be integrated towards a common goal. It's, it's such a great point you make, Gene. I, I uh, and I really like that that analogy. As I said, I think it really brings to life a, n a number of points that you've been raising. And, and I think another thread that I I see pulled across our conversation is the need for leaders to lead with great empathy. Um, you, you talk about the the need to evaluate individual experience and ensure that people are treated with dignity and respect. Uh, that they're uh, given what they need to succeed, that they are recognized by people whose opinions matter. Um, and that if any of these uh, scenarios are not in place, then some sort of correction is necessary. And, and I like in a, in a deeply technical uh, uh, treatise <laughs> that you focus on, you focus a lot on, as this conversation has, on the, the leadership element, the people element associated with this as well. I, I wonder if you could maybe linger on those points a little bit longer if you would. No, I love that question. And if I can maybe go from platitude to maybe concrete. Uh, and so one of the um, you know, frustrations, right, is that on one hand, uh, you know, it can sound so much like a platitude, right? People treat people with dignity. I mean, boy, that, that's uh, so depressing to think that treating people with dignity is a platitude. But uh, I mean, it's uh, you find this in the lean literature, uh, you know, a little more concretely, people talk about frontline empowerment. Um, uh, a little even more concretely yet, right? There's a lot of research that says that, uh, you know, employee engagement is absolutely critical for organizational success, right? If you can't, how can you solve someone else's problems if you can't even solve your own problems? And I find that to be a very persuasive, uh, um, you know, observation. But you know, I would say that, you know, let's, uh, I think we can derive why this is so important for leaders uh, just by looking at, 
where their time must be spent. So like given um, any significant amount of problems, right, the leader's job is not to do the layer one and layer two work, right? Because if they have a uh, 10, a hundred or a thousand people, right, at best they can you know, contribute 1%, 10% of the effort, right? So clearly, you know, their job is to help others do their work, um, do their work well, do their work easily. Um, and moreover, right, uh, there are probably problems that people doing the work will face that they don't have the authority or the line of the visibility to solve. And so it only the leaders can uh, address uh, those problems. And so I, I find it um, very satisfying to kind of give this logical proof <laughs> that uh, it might be interpreted that the leader's job is to be nice, <laughs> to, you know, to, to people. But no, no, uh, Dr. Ron Westrom, who uh, studied organizational um, culture, he said this five marks of great leaders, high energy, high standards. They're great in the large, right? In that organizational wiring, they're great in the small, you know, so they know when they're being uh, lied to or things are being misrepresented. Uh, but they also love walking the floor. And I just found his um, those five things to be so have such high explanatory power um, because in my experience, right, the greatest, uh, the best leader I've seen have all five of those characteristics, and you know the ones that I um, have seen oversee organizations uh, doing not so great, <laughs> right, are missing many or if not all of those characteristics. Uh, does that resonate with your own experiences, Peter? It does. It does. Yeah, it really well articulated. Uh... You know, Gene, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, uh, more broadly speaking, IT revolution. I think it's really mm -hmm. fascinating the work more generally that you're, 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 you and your team are doing. The you become a book publisher of other people's <laughs> works as well. You've brought together a, a numerous uh, thought leaders in various uh, forms and functions, including uh, conferences that you build. Uh, talk a bit about your your day to day to work work beyond uh, the publication of uh, of great uh, books like this one. Oh yeah, uh, well. Yeah, I, I love the saying uh, that you're only as smart as the top five people you hang out with, <laughs> right? And, and uh, yeah, so you know, I think a personal goal is to just find the best uh, thinkers and doers in the game. Um, and you know, so we started a uh, technology conference uh, ten years ago. Uh, we've had nineteen events called the DevOps Enterprise Summit, um, and the goal was uh, in 2014. Uh, to study not so much the tech giants, the Facebooks, Amazons, Netflix, Googles, and Microsofts. Instead, it was um, you know, large complex organizations that have been around for decades or even centuries uh, and show that the same principles and practices that made the tech giants great, you know, uh, can be used in, you know, uh, some of the most recognized brands across every industry vertical to help them win in the marketplace. And just a little, uh, you know, trivia fact, uh, the oldest organization that presented uh, was the UK HMRC. Uh, so that's uh, His Majesty's um uh, uh, HMRC, His Majesty's Revenue and Custom Service. So uh, like their version of the IRS, they were founded in the year 1200. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I love the, you know, there's obviously no code that goes that far back, but there's certainly, you know, traditions and values and maybe processes that certainly go back centuries. And so, uh, you know, it's just amazing to see these technology leaders who are courageous, you know, that uh, have all those characteristics that uh, Dr. Ron Westrom talked about, um, yeah, be able to you know just transform uh, the work within their organization to make it uh, so that a you know a single parent could do their tax filing on the bus on the ride home, uh, as opposed to you know taking hours um, you know involving lots of misery <laughs> and uh, uh, and time. That's something that I'm just enormously proud of. That we have uh, had had over 1,100 talks across uh, you know some of the, almost every industry vertical, and uh, we've had so many experts that. Uh, you know, we feel whose expertise were necessary to help us get from here to there, like Dr. Nicholas Forsgren, who I wrote a book with, uh, or in the state of DevOps research called Accelerate, Dr. Ron Westrom, you know, whose work has been so influential to organizational culture and so forth. Yeah, we recently renamed the conference to uh, uh, from DevOps Enterprise Summit to the Enterprise Technology Leadership Summit. And um, it was really uh, brought to bear because uh, so many people came up to me over the years and said, I can't get my friends to go. Because um, why do I need to go to a conference about uh, you know deployment pipelines? It's like oh no, <laughs> DevOps uh, DevOps started 15 years ago. It's like how do you get DevOps to work better together? And you know, uh, 15 years later, it's now about a, a technology, <laughs> which is uh, I guess uh, happens in many domains. <laughs> indeed, indeed. 
Well, Gene Kim, uh, congratulations again on on uh, this terrific book, uh, Wiring the Winning Organization. I certainly recommend it uh, to those who are listening and watching. Uh, and also, thank you so much for all the great work that you do uh, of, of great influence to to this uh, cohort that we, we both uh, spend so much time with. And it's my great pleasure to spend a little bit more time with you. Thank you so much for doing so. Oh, Peter, right back at you. And uh, again, thank you so much. And uh, again, congratulations on all your amazing achievements. And I so much look forward to the next time we get to hang out. Yeah, I do as well, Gene. Thank you so much.